just my monitor. All right, so we're going to be talking about arrays. An array is just a sequence of data. Now we can get more specific about that definition. In this language, an array is a sequence of data consisting of elements of the same type in contiguous memory. Contiguous being a fancy word. What's it mean? Contiguous just means one after the other, right? All next to each other. You go down a street and there's contiguous houses, right? Do, 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 do. But what if there's a 7-Eleven in the middle of it? Then there's no, not contiguous anymore. Or what if you had houses in random order all over the place? That's not contiguous. So the reason it's cool that arrays are contiguous is because you can step through them very quickly. Not, 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 not. Like that. So if you have memory that looks like this, that's about enough of that, right? All right, if you have memory like this and you create an array that's three elements long of ints, well, how many bytes does an int take? We've mentioned this before. It's 32 bits, so it's how many bytes? Well, how many bits are there in a byte? I know somebody knows this. Y'all all got it right on the exam. Bits in a byte, guy. How many? Six. Two? Four? Eight? Twelve. Eight bits in a byte. <laughs> uh. All right, so eight bits in a byte. And an int is 32 bits, which is four bytes. So an array of three ints, three times four, is 12 bytes. OK, so that's byte one, or that's a byte. Here's two more bytes. So the first int occupies that much space. The second byte occupies that much. Whoopsie, where'd that come from? And then the third int occupies that much space. So if we wanted to store the numbers 1, 2, and 3, or 8, 6, 7, like if you like classic rock and you know the song 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 0, 9, if we wanted to store the number 8 here, and the number 6 here, and the number 7 here, right? That's how it looks. Although, you know, it's actually, you know, it's 32 bits long. So, you know, it's a whole bunch of zeros and ones. But that's how it looks in memory. If it was an array of long longs, long longs are 8 bytes long. So all of this memory would be de dedicated to one long long. And all of this memory would be dedicated to another long long. So what is cool about it being contiguous is that if we say I want an array of three ints, like int nums three, like that. What it really stores is that nums starts at address 0000. zero, zero, zero or 1000, right. Each one of these is four bytes long. Now, if you want to store a number in the nums, the first element of nums, how did you do it in Python? What did you stick between the square braces to specify the first spot in a list? Who took Python? So I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on somebody. Parker, what number do you stick between the square brace is the subscript to access the first element of a list in Python? Uh. <laughs> or Nathan. You just start counting at zero. The first one is at zero, the second one is at one, the third one is at two. So if we want to store eight, six, seven, the nums zero is equal to eight, nums one is equal to six, and nums two and we would put semicolons at the end to prevent syntax errors. 867. And after we were done with those three statements, we would have 8, 6, and 7 stored out in memory. So if it wants to access nums 0, here's the formula it follows. The address in nums 
plus the subscript, which is a number in square braces, times the size, which in this case is 4, right? So to get what num0 is, to locate num0, takes the address that's stored in the nums variable, which I said was 1,000, plus the subscript, which is 0, times the size of an int, which we decided was, just look up at the line above and you can tell me. Come on, guy, what are the last two words of the line above where I'm typing? That's the size of an int, right? Four bytes. And so if we added all that together, 1,000 plus 0 times 4 is 1,000. So it runs out and locates memory address 1,000, and an 8 is stored in it. Just like we said there. How about nums subscript 2? So nums subscript 2, well, the nums array is stored at address 1000. That hasn't changed. What is our subscript? Minky said it, I think. What was it? And what is the size of an int? Four bytes. Okay, so it's 1,000 plus what's 2 times 4? 8. So it's at memory address 1,008. So it blips up here, and there it is. It's stored at memory address 8, and so that is a 7, just like we saw there. So stepping through an array is the fastest possible data access for multiple elements because your processor can ask for multiple bytes at the same time. You know, the controller that's interacting with memory your chip can just go, okay, yo, I, I want 800 bytes starting at memory address 6007. And it'll do it, right? It'll transfer it all. And then it can start stepping through them individually. That's different than a Python list. In a Python list, the order in which the data is stored is not necessarily contiguous. Might be, might not be. Another difference is that in most languages, like C, C++, Java, JavaScript, once you set the size of the array, it's fixed. I've got three numbers in it. I allocated three. What if I wanted to add the next number? The song goes 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, 9. And what if I want to store five in it? Too bad. I made only space for three. I can't stick the rest of that phone number in here. An array is fixed in length. doesn't expand. However, a list in Python, you can add as many values to it as you want. You could do, you know, L dot add and add a five and an L dot add and add a three, and, you know, and you, and you can make the list as long as you want. So let's put a couple of facts out here. What? What was that? All right. So an array is a series of data elements of the same type addressed by their subscript. The elements are contiguous in memory, meaning they're one after the other. An array is a fixed length. Is Siri talking to me? What's going on in here? Siri, shut up. Hello? <laughs> Apparently I'm FaceTiming myself. I don't know. All right. So an array is a fixed length, meaning that it cannot expand or shrink, unlike Python lists. It's one of the things that makes Python easier to use. If you want it to be longer, you have to make a brand new array and copy all the old elements into the new one. And the code for that, you know, you can do it, but there's better ways of doing that. You'd use something else other than an array. So you declare an array like this. You give it a type, you give it a name, and you put square braces, and you put the size between the square braces. That's one way to do it. So like if it was a string array, you might create an array called colors. And you might say, I want to store 10 colors in it. Right? But there's another way. You can do the type followed by the name. I see a lot of folks not actually watching when I'm typing, and it's hurting my feelings. 
and then you can give it an initializer list, elements separated by commas. Now you saw that in Python, except you used square braces. So for example, string names is equal to, and you could put some names here, you know, like that. Those are the two ways to declare an array. <coughs> There's that way, <coughs> you specify the length. There's this way where you fill it with initializer values and it decides the length. You don't have to specify it. You could, not a syntax error to specify the length, but you don't have to. So let's go ahead and create our code so that we can start playing with arrays. What lecture are we on, gang? Uh, w. W, all righty. Uh, lecture whisk. I'm not saying whiskey. All right, so we're on CPP. Lecture, thanks. W. <laughs> we ought to do a C sharp application before we get done. And the reason why I say that, nah, I won't even talk about it, but after Thanksgiving, so that we can draw a form and have fields and check boxes and stuff like that, so make a graphical user interface. That'd be fun. Ooh, that sounds pretty difficult. Surprisingly, it's not. If you've ever done Visual Basic, it's very similar to that. Where is the from Windows 32 console? Pardon me? Where is yeah. the difference between the Windows 32 console or anti yeah, anti project? Creating a project for a Windows 32 console application. Let's choose that and see what it looks like. All right, it starts throwing in some Microsoft-specific stuff. Here's a type called tcar and a file called standardafx.h. And it doesn't have a main, it's got tmain. It's got some Microsoft-specific stuff, so that's why I don't do that. We could learn it, but then the Mac users aren't going to be able to use it or the, uh, you know, the Linux users. You know, if you're writing a, you know, a bash script with GCC to compile it, um, that's why we don't do that. But it's specified, it's specific for Windows 32-bit applications. Wait a minute, did they, did they create a Windows 64 console application? I don't know, or maybe 32 and 64 work the same on Windows? I don't know, that's a good question. Maybe uh, this version here was created before Windows 64. Let's, uh, what am I trying to do here? I need to go back to my lecture W. All righty, boilerplate time. I already got my boilerplate. Oh, I'm just trying to check my boy grades. Yeah, if you're behind in assignments, Thanksgiving might be a good time to catch up because I know you all know enough to get them done. All right. So I'm going to make... Oh, and by the way, if you're using one of the new versions on your laptop, you can probably just make a console app and not have to create a new item like this. You might just be able to create it directly. I've asked the uh, IT team if they can update these machines with the newer version of Visual Studio so we're not eight years in the past. All right, so let's declare an array of integers. I don't know, 10 integers. So we give the type, we give the name of the array, we use the square braces, and inside the square braces, we put the number of elements that we want. That's one way. Or we could create a second array. I'm going to call it ARR for whatever reason. Equals, and then we can put some numbers in it, all separated by commas. Who cares what the numbers are? I'm just typing them at random. Please don't bother typing in the same numbers. It's not worth it. 
type in the same numbers? Yeah, don't bother. Don't type in 5, 656, five, six, whatever. Just type in a bunch of numbers separated by commas. Now, when you make an array in this language, if you're going to specify the length of it, it's a good idea to declare that as a constant. So if I was a good programmer, I would make a constant that, to hold that 10. So I would have gone to the line above it and typed in const space int space nums underscore size equals 10 semicolon. And then I would have used that in here. And I'll tell you why in a minute. First, I'm just going to demonstrate it like that. Just like that. Now, the reason you do that is that some languages give you commands, functions, to get the length of the array. For example, in Python, you can do this. n is equal to len, you know, the list name, right? That works great in Python. You're using Java. n is equal to um, array, right, dot length, like that, right? That works in Java. You're using C sharp. n is equal to array dot length with a capital L. Right, that works in C sharp. And C++, how do you get the length of the array? Sorry, you can't. Now that's not strictly true. In some places you can get the length of the array, and in some places you can't. Strictly speaking, you can get the length of the array as long as you're within the same square braces in which it was declared. But if you pass it to a function, you can't get the length of the array anymore. So if you have this constant defined, you can just check that to find out what the length of the array is. So if we wanted to know the length of the array here in C++, we would do something like n is equal to nums underscore size, right? Because we have that number available to us. So that's why it's good programming to define the length of the array as a constant. Especially if you're going to be passing the array around into a class or a method or a function or anything like that. If you are in the same context, within the same square braces, you can get the size of the array by doing this trick. int size underscore of underscore nums is equal to size of, all lowercase, parentheses, the array name, which in this case is nums, in parentheses, divided by size of, parentheses, and what's the type of the array? What, what is each element? What did I declare my array as? A strings, longs, doubles, ints, what did I declare the array as? The ints. Right, so size of the int. Now that works. That gets me the length of the array. This only works between the braces the array is defined in. Which is why it's a good idea to create a constant and use that instead. All righty. Well, why don't we print out our array? Right? We've got this int nums num size array. Let's print it out. We can use an index based for loop to print it out. May have done this in fundamentals. For int i, I like i, short for, for index, equals 0, semicolon. i is less than the length of the array. Now, I calculated the length of the array two different ways. Right? I did so just right here, but I also have it as a constant up here, so I'm just going to use that instead. So i is less than nums underscore size, semicolon, i plus plus. Let's get the value out. Int value equals nums subscript i in subscript, and let's print it out. C out i followed by a space, followed by a value, followed by endl. Now, honestly, I could have skipped this step right here. And maybe I will. 
What I could do is delete value here and replace it with nums subscript i. It's unnecessary to copy it into that temporary variable like that. There's a reason I did it like that, though, and I'll show you why. I'm going to use a for each loop to step through the array now. Now, again, this only works within the curly braces, but the cool thing about it is that you don't know, have to know the size. This is what a for each looks like. Let's, let's give a comment here. Use an index based for loop to print the array. That's what we did there. Now we're going to use a for each loop. Use a for each loop to print the array. And this is going to look a lot more like what you did in Python. Now it could be that y'all didn't take Python in the last semester, but 20 semesters ago, and you wish I'd shut up about it. But anyways, for parentheses, int value, colon, nums, in parentheses, curly brace, c out less than less than, value less than less than endl. That looks a lot shorter, right? I am going to make the change that I mentioned up here, though. Because if I ask you on an exam how to print an array using an index-based for loop, adding an extra line of code in there is just going to take you that much longer. So I'm going to delete this line. Int value is equal to nums. Just nuke that and replace this with nums subscript i. So what am I doing? Why did I stick i here? Because that's the index counter. So I want to see what index, what value is associated with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, we didn't stick any data in the nums array. doesn't have any data at all. So who knows what it's going to print? I have a guess, but I'm not sure. Let's run it and find out. Do I still have my pause at the bottom? Yep. And there it goes. It's got this garbage value in it. We created the array, or we asked C to give us an array, and it did. It gave us that much memory. But it didn't store anything in the memory. So we have a block of memory. It's 10 elements long. Each int is 4. So it allocated 40 bytes for our array, but it didn't initialize it to anything. So it's got all this garbage in it. There's a way you can initialize it, though. If we want them all to be zero, there's a really fast and easy way of initializing it. And so I recommend that you do this. If you're going to create an array using this syntax, just tack on an initializer that looks like this. Go up to your nums line, tack that on. What that does is it sets the first value. Tell you what. Change that to something else other than zero, just to prove the point. Make that some number like 98765, whatever. We'll probably change it to zero in a minute, but I want you to see something first. And the question being, is it going to allocate the array to length 10 and set every number to 98765? Not quite. Here's what it does. It sets the first value to 98765, and the rest of them are all set to zero. So if we set the first one to zero and then the rest of them are automatically set to zero, it's a nice way of wiping the array clean, setting them all equal to zero. What? Oh, I'll pause it in a second and come help and make sure. Okay. So now our data is all nice and clean, right? It's all zeros, and we could start storing other numbers in it. Like we can make random numbers or we could ask the user, you know, for sales for that day or the water, you know, the amount of rain for that month or something like that. Let's stick some value into our nums array. Nums subscript zero equals eight. How many 
people know the song that I'm referring to, 8675309. Surely some of y'all listen to classic rock. Thank you. Num subscript 1 equals 6. Num subscript 2 equals 5. 86, no, wait, 7. Num subscript 3. This is going to be about enough. I don't feel the urge to go the whole way. 8675. And so when we print the array out by its index, we see its index followed by the value. There's an 8 in the first one, there's a 6 in the second one, there's a 7 in the third one, there's a 5 in the fourth one. Let's see if we can get the memory address out at the same time. I'm not sure this is going to work. As soon as I do this, I'll stop and uh, make sure everybody's doing okay. But in our first for loop, before our ENDL, right, before that, Let's do oh. less than less, whoops. Let's do the address, and I really don't know if this is going to work. Nums subscript i in subscript less than less than ENDL. Because I want to see the address. I want to make sure that they're all four apart, like I just promised that they would be when I was drawing my pictures. And the ampersand means the address of. So we should see some number that represents a place in memory. Yep, there it is. And is each one four apart? Yeah. Like that one's at E0, the next one's at E4, the next one's at E8, and so on. It looks like I forgot to put a space between my number and my address. So I'm going to go and modify my print statement one more time to put a space here. Or maybe I'll stick at memory address, right, like that. Now, if I ask you to write a loop that prints out an array in homework or in an exam, don't go nuts and print out the index number and print out the address and stuff like that, unless you just seems to make sense to you. That's, this is just as part of the learning process. Right, here we go. You know, 0, 4, 8, each one is, is 4 bytes long. If we made it an array of long longs rather than ints, we would see that they are larger, that they would be 8 bytes apart. Not going to bother, but they would be. How about that second array? We don't even know the length of that second array. That's when we would have to use the size of trick. And we better use the size of trick before we need to pass it to some other kind of function. But I promised that I was going to stop and uh, I don't even know. Now that I've scrolled up and down so much, I'm not sure what, what portion of the code you all need to see. Let's, let's pause. OK. so. I don't know the length of this array, and I want to know it. So if you have an array that's initialized like this, then making a constant to hold its size isn't really going to work, but we can get its size anyways just by doing that size of thing. int array size equals size of parentheses AIR in parentheses divided by size of parentheses and its data type is int. Now we can print that data out using a uh, in an index based loop. So for parentheses and i equals zero semicolon i is less than, we calculated the length of it as size of r, so arr underscore size, semicolon, i plus plus. So c out less than, less than, nums, wait, no, this array is called arr. 
ARR open square brace end quote less than less than I less than less than quote square brace equals close quote less than less than ARR subscript I less than less than ENDL. And make sure your colors show that the strings are all matched up, right? Because that's a string right there. That's why it's yellow on mine. It might be a different color on yours. This is all the same color as well because that's another string. And everything outside of it's black because it's not part of the string. All right. And so ARR0 is 5, 1 is 656, six, 2 and 3, and so on. Make another array, an array of names. To hold names, it needs to be a string. So string names, and we don't know how long the array is because we're going to use an initializer list, so I'm not going to put any number between the squares, equals, and I'm just going to stick some names in here. All right. Tony, in quote. Peter, in quote. All right, somebody give me the first name of some Avengers or something. <laughs> All right, Captain. Cap, I don't know his real name. All right. Steve, uh, Steve, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have Tony, Peter, and Steve here. All right. But just like I said... As soon as you make an array using an initializer list, you should get the length of it. So int names underscore size equals, and somebody tell me what I'm going to type here. I'll pick on Serena because she's close to me and can hit me. Names uh, underscore size equals what? Size of names. Yeah. Divided by size of string. Exactly. Size of string because it's an array of strings. All right, and let's make a string of their favorite food. String food in food equals. All right. Tony likes apples, in quote, comma. Peter likes pizza, in quote, comma. Steve likes ice cream. Yes. So let's print out both arrays at the same time. So it'll say Tony likes apples, Peter likes pizza, Steve likes ice cream. It's another index base for loop. For int i equals zero i is less than names underscore size semicolon i plus plus in parentheses semi curly brace c out less than less than names subscript i in subscript Less than, less than, quote, space, likes to eat, space, end quote. Less than, less than, food, subscript I, in subscript, less than, less than, ENDL. So it should say Tony likes to eat apples, Peter likes to eat pizza, and Steve likes to eat ice cream. And as predicted, thankfully I didn't make any typos, that's what it says.
These are what is known are known as parallel arrays. I'm going to add a comment to that effect. Names and food are parallel arrays. You know what parallel lines are, right? Parallel arrays are arrays of the same length. where the elements are linked by their subscripts. So what does that mean? Name subscript 0 is Tony. Food subscript 0 is apples. So Tony likes apples. Name subscript 1 is Peter. Food subscript 1 is pizza. So Peter likes pizza. And Steve likes ice cream. Well, why do they have to be of the same length? Well, what if we had four foods listed here? Um, you know, I don't know. He likes asparagus. Nobody likes asparagus, right? Because there's no fourth name up here. That wouldn't crash. But it would be very bad if we had more names than we had foods. We could prove that. I'm going to delete asparagus here, and I'm going to tack on a fourth name just to see what horrible output I get. It's not a parallel array if if one array has more elements than the other one. So I'm going to add this, and then I'm going to immediately delete it. So if you don't want to do this, it's fine. All right, so there's a new person named Bob. Bob the Builder? Yeah, Bob the Builder joined the Avengers. Okay. But it blew up. <laughs> yeah, it blew up because there were more elements in one array than there were in the other. And so that brings up an important topic. If you access an element past the end of the array, it's an error. It might not tell you it's an error. It might not crash like that, but it's still bad. So in this case, it did catch it as being an error, and the, and the uh, program told us not to do it, right? I mean, it, it stopped running. But if I try to run it without debugging, it might not generate that error. Let's see. Well, it still did. It ran for a while, and I, it crashed it so bad it even didn't even leave the window on the screen. It's interesting. All right, so you never want there to be more elements in one array than there are in the other for a parallel array. So I'm going to make an itty bitty array down here, down at the bottom. I hope y'all were done typing with that, that print loop. I guess I'll leave that on the screen. Int ax, I don't know what it means, or ia because it's an int array, in subscript is equal to, just type in some numbers, 100, 200, 300. Now let's print out five elements in the array. There's only three, so this is a serious error. Four parentheses, int i equals zero, semicolon, i less than five, semicolon, i plus plus, c out less than less than, i a subscript i, or tell you what, c out less than less than, i less than less than, quote, space, quote, less than, less than, IA. That's wrong, not IA. I subscript I in subscript less than, less than ENDL. So we're trying to print five elements from a three element array. Might crash, might not, but it's not going to have valid data. The first three are going to be valid. The next ones are certainly not going to be valid because they're not there. It's like, you know, I give you the street address of a house that doesn't exist on my street. You're going to go there, and you're just not going to like what you find, because there's not going to be a house there. All right. And so look, 100, 200, 300, and then there's garbage value. You could even try to change these pieces of data. What would happen if we tried to change index element 4? There's only three spaces, so this is seriously bad news. If we do IA subscript 4 in subscript equals, you know, 98765, whatever, doesn't matter what number we set. And then we run it again. It blew up. 
Well, and mine didn't, right? It set element four equal to nine eight seven six five, but it corrupted the memory at that location, and it's pure accident that it continued to run. It could have crashed, or it can just run with this silent error where there's some data corrupted somewhere. We may not find that out, out that it's corrupted. Now, when I close the app, the debugger may tell me that some memory was corrupted, but it may not. Even the debugger didn't catch that that was an error. So never access past the end of the array. If you have three elements in the array, you can get to 0, 1, 2. If you have five elements in the array, you can get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Or if you want to get all technical about it, you say you can access elements 0 through n minus 1, where n is the size of the array. So if the array is a million elements long, you can access elements 0 through 999 comma 999. I wonder if this has enough memory to create something with a million elements. Mm -hmm. Let's find out. I'm going to comment these lines out because, you know, we've been seeing some syntax errors out of them. An int ia subscript a million. One, and I need six zeros to make it a million. There, I think that's a million. And I'm going to fill them with a million consecutive numbers with a loop, just to see if this works. First time I've tried this. For int i equals zero, semicolon, i is less than a million. I should have declared a constant, right? Let's do that. Let's be good programmers. So above here, const space int space ia underscore size equals a million. One followed by six zeros. Two, three, four, five, six. And since it's a const, technically I should have made that all caps. Don't got to, but that's kind of the rule of thumb. And then so my array is int ia subscript ia underscore size all caps. And then when we're going to print it out for int i equals zero, i is less than ia underscore size semicolon i plus plus. Except I'm not going to print it out. I'm just setting the variables, the values. Curly brace and inside the curly brace is ia subscript i equals i. And since i is counting to a million, that means every element in the array is going to be one more. The first element's a zero, the second one's a one, the third one's a two, and so on. So their index and their value are going to be the same. It's going to work. All righty. Something bad happened. <laughs> stack overflow. The stack is, is the amount of memory that is used for allocating variables and arrays. And we ran out. We used up all the memory. Now, there might be a compiler switch that we could tell it that, oh, by the way, we really do need a million elements in our array. I'm going to stop my debugger with the red button, and I'm going to lower that number from a million to something a little, bit, a little bit less ridiculous. Now, this uh, is showing me all this, um, <laughs> all of this weird code. All right, so I'm going to close that and go back to my lecture code. I'm just going to try 100,000 instead and see if that works. All right, so 100,000 it can handle. So it can allocate 400,000 bytes. How do I know it's 400,000? Because it's 100,000 times the size of an int. Well, let's prove that to ourselves. Let's get the size of the array and print it out. See how less than, less than. IA size equals, end quote, less than, less than, size of, parentheses, IA. But I'm not going to divide it by int because that would just tell me 100,000 again. End parentheses, arrow, arrow, quote, space, bytes, backslash n, end quote, semicolon. All right, and there it is. IA size is 400,000. I wonder if the limit is a megabyte, right? If we set this to 200,000, it's going to be 800,000. 
I'm just playing at this point. Yep, that worked. Well, what is a million divided by four? 250,000. That worked. A million bytes. Well, how about 500,000? I'm just wondering how big it will get before we get that exception again. Okay, 500,000 was too many, so I'm going to click break. Click the red box. Close that assembler we're seeing. 200,000 works, so how about 400,000? Nope. Break. Click the red to stop. Close the assembler. 300,000? It breaks. Yeah, all right. Well, 250. It's somewhere between 250 and 300,000 where it stops breaking. I'm going to change that back to 100,000 because that seemed to comfortably work. And I'm not going to print it out because it's 100,000 different elements long, right? But we could get the sum. I know you've been dying to find out what the sum of all the numbers between 1 and 100,000 are. I have been. But let's find out. We're going to write a loop that sums all of those values. Now that's going to be a large number, so I'm going to create a double because a double holds the largest size, right? So double space sum equals, yeah, you could try a long, long, see if it works. Double space sum equals zero. And in this case, let's just use a for each loop because the syntax is easier and we don't need the index. So for parentheses int value colon IA. So for every value in, in the IA array, int value colon IA, sum plus equals value, semicolon. And let's print that sum out with a CF statement. Uh, you forgot your braces. In this particular case, it works OK. But very good point, because somebody's uh, error in one of their programs they wrote was to have like two lines in a row. Don't type this, please. Like that. And their code didn't work. And the reason why is there weren't braces around it. If there's only one line of code, it's OK to leave the braces out. But if it's two, it doesn't work. So to be safe, it's better to add the braces always. So C out less than, less than, sum. Wait, let's put some descriptive text right there. Sum of IA equals, space, end quote, less than, less than, sum, less than, less than, ENDL. I'm losing my voice. Everybody loses their voice at some point. Yeah, I've lectured five classes today, so... All right, and so the sum of all those numbers was 4.999 times 10 to the 9. Oh, wait, I forgot this one breaks. I'm going to change it to a long, long like Nathan did and see how that looks. See if it gives a more precise value than 0 0.99999. Yeah, okay, it really is that, right? I don't know how many zeros that is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9... So it's about 5 billion. The sum of the numbers between 1 and 100,000 is 5 billion. Now we know. I like storing it in a I like storing my sums in doubles so that it's easier to calculate the average. I don't have to worry about integer division where, you know, an int divided by an int rounds down or a long divided by an int rounds down. So I'm going to change that back to a double. All right, that is about enough for our first lecture about arrays. And what have we learned? We've learned that stack overflow. There are eight bits in a byte. Oh, well, that's not having to do with arrays. An int is 32 bits equals four bytes. So an array of three bytes is, of three ints is 12. And if it was a double or a long, long, that's eight bytes. So it'd be three times eight is 24. And this is just our little silly memory diagram. 
And so we could create an array of link three, and that means we could assign three values to it. And since it's of link three, we can get zero, one, and two in there. So an array is a series of data elements of the same type addressed by their subscript. The elements are contiguous in memory. And if you took these notes, add one more very important thing. All the elements are of the same type. Now that wasn't true in Python lists. In Python lists, you could put an int followed by a float, followed by a boolean, followed by a string, followed by a circle, followed by a turtle, turtle, you know, anything. You can make a list of any kind, and and that makes Python really flexible and also can make list processing really strange. In most languages, well, Python doesn't use arrays, and that's why it's able to get away with that. But C++ uses arrays, and in every other language, an array, all the elements are of the same type. So what does that mean? If I tried to edit my code so that one of these things was a number, you know, uh, like that, I made that a 7, that won't work because these are of different types. It doesn't work in any code. It worked in Python. Isn't that what's weird? Or, you know, if I thought that this array needed, you know, the word thousand there. Again, won't work. Won't work in Java, JavaScript, C++, C Sharp, Java, you know, 8 million other languages. So in general, consider it that every element in an array is of the same type. So Python has no arrays at all. It has lists which we pretend are arrays for the purpose of teaching fundamentals. <laughs> lists are more flexible than arrays. They're better than arrays in a lot of ways. That's why Mr. Python, I forget his name, um, decided that Python didn't even need arrays because once you had lists, they're more powerful than arrays. Why? An array is fixed in length. I can't tack on a fourth name. But with Python, you can. I just do names.add and stick on a fourth name. I can't delete the first element and have it only be too long. I can in Python, right? So Python is cool. Lists are cool. And C++ has something that's like that called a vector. And Java has something like that called an array list where it grows and it shrinks. But they are a fixed length. That's worth adding to our notes if you type these in. Oh, I already did. An array is a fixed length. It cannot expand or shrink, unlike Python lists. So to declare the array, you use the type, followed by the name of the array, followed by the size. So string, space, colors. I want 10 strings in my array called colors. Or you can leave off the size, and you can give it an initializer list. String names at initializer is equal to Joe, Bob, and Jim. And that was the end of our notes. All righty. I'd kind of like to not assign you all homework over Thanksgiving break. I strongly encourage those of you all who are behind on the homework assignments. You know, all the overdue homework assignments now have zeros next to them just to scare you. Doesn't mean that I, I'm not going to give you credit once you upload them. Right, I'll give you full credit. I don't care that they're late. I just want you to get them done. So if you look at your grade and you see a whole bunch of zeros for late assignments, just go, whoops, I better get them done. And let's not give any homework over arrays just for that purpose, to give you time to do that. I mean, I want everybody to have a good Thanksgiving and stuff, but I also want you to get, get your work done if you're behind. Make sense? Nobody's saying, yeah, makes sense. I love it. I love it, Prof. All right, let's uh, stop our lecture then and make the oh. Dropbox.